Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hello, ever dearest kapamilya, and I hope and enjoy, uh, that you have enjoyed our praise and worship a while ago. You know, a good life to everyone, and of course, also to those who will be joining us in our online service today. May the Holy Spirit and precious Spirit of God be with you all as we join together our hearts, minds, souls, worshiping and praising God and hearing His precious words in the name of our awesome, beautiful name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord led me to prepare this mindful message today that not just to warn, but mainly to remind and also to enlighten those Christians out there, especially, who are walking in the dark up to now, thinking that they are all right doing what they do, you know. And I'm here to present and bring the precious words of the Lord in truth that many might be truly set free from the bondage of our enemy, Satan, which they might not really be aware of. You know? And ignorance of God's truth of words will bring anybody to hell, brothers and sisters. If you still reject the truth after hearing it today, then this is what I'll say. Ignorance of the law excuses no one. So my loving advice to you is please don't ignore God's law. You know, if non-believers, especially the evolutionists and the atheists, has what they call the Big Bang, Christians has also one. And it is found in the precious book, the Bible. And it might happen, maybe soon or sooner, as what we expect. You know, it is written in the Bible. Definitely. You know, in Revelations. You will see in Second Peter as well. You know, and, you know, the Bible uh, has a meaning personally to me. And it, this is what it says. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instruction before leaving earth. You know. The Bible is basically our guidebook to tell us what to do and how to do things as we live our lives as true born-again Christians, leading our very true followers of the precious book to destination where they will be with the Lord Jesus Christ in the future. It is the precious instructional book of eternal life that if you follow what it says, then you will have the eternity in heaven that God promises. Mind you, the book ends with God's victory over sin, over sinners and Satan, bringing them all to eternal punishment and torment in the end. But gloriously, giving God the good, peaceful, and perfect, abundant life to all true and faithful Christians. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that anyone who will be foolish enough not to choose to be on God's side, the winning side. But unfortunately, the Bible says about the truth that there will be only few who will find life and there are so many a vast majority will choose to be on the devil's side the losing side so my utmost concern compassion and for those who choose god's side but seems to be in doubt confused and weak so i pray and hope that after these words of the lord they will be enlightened to repent and bring their standing in the rightful place with God. Amen. You now in Revelations 20.10 and 14-15, to this is the final destination of Satan and his followers. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire of brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is where Satan and his followers, the demons be, and the false prophets. And the, those people who will follow him, the Revelation 14, 15 said, 20, 14, 15 said, Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which we know is hell. So they will all together be in hell. You know, In Revelation 21, 1, 3, and 4, this is where the people of God will be and where the new heaven and new earth are expected to be created by the Lord. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no sea. So, meaning to say, the Lord will create a new earth for the righteous people of God. And it follows in 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God with, with men. He, is, he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away 
every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things had passed away. Wow, what a promise and what a plan of God for all the righteous men for, before Him. We learn that there's a second destruction of the world to come. The first being the Noah's flood, where God only saved eight righteous people, Noah and his family. Just imagine the truthfulness of God's word, where it says only a few will find life. You know, history will repeat itself, believe me. Just imagine how many people already during those ancient times, when they tend to live as long as 900 years. How many millions can there already be? But the Bible says only eight among the probably millions were saved by God just for one good reason. And that is righteousness. In 2 Peter 3, 7, this is how the second, you know, destruction will be. It says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. If the first destruction was by flood and water, the next will be by this fire and brimstone that will melt everything on earth, you know? And, you know, Noah hasn't been chosen to be saved by God just for any reason at all. He was chosen because of his righteous walk with God. So let's look at it. Genesis 6, 5, 8, 9, and 11, 13. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, continuously, continually. But Noah, take note of this, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, a perfect, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Very simple, brothers and sisters. And because of the wickedness of man, the Lord destroyed the whole earth and together with all the people in it, excluding, excluding eight people, Noah's family. You know? And I want you to all focus and be reminded of what the Bible says on the coming second destruction of the world, where this time is the total and complete destruction of the whole earth. Not just the world sub being submerged or being destroyed, but the whole earth as if vanishing in the universe. Because why? There's a new earth that will be created by God. You know, God himself will create a new earth where righteousness dwells, meaning where his righteous, faithful followers will live wonderfully, peacefully, and abundantly forever with him. The Bible says that just like Noah's days, the end of the world will come. And try to imagine what happened those times, during those times of Noah, when he's preparing the ark, you know, their salvation. You know, in, in our Bible study last night, we talk about the gospel. You know? During Noah's ark, Noah's uh, generation, there is a gospel that's also being preached. The gospel of the ark, which is the salvation of uh, man during those times. And in our generation today, the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation in our time. You know, in 2 Peter 3.13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what I'm telling. That the new earth will be created by God, vanishing the old earth, and the new earth where righteousness dwells, where the righteous people of God will be put in. You know, in Matthew, in, in Luke 17, 25, 27, it says that, I believe in my heart that history will repeat itself as what it says, just like in the days of Noah. It said, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation as it was in the days of Noah. Don't you know that when Noah started building the ark, preaching the gospel of the ark, the salvation, he was also rejected like what Jesus Christ had suffered preaching the salvation of God and was being rejected almost by the whole, whole of the Hebrew people, the whole of Israel, you know, just like in the days of Noah. So it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married their wives, they're given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. You know, during the, Jesus' time, when he's preaching the gospel, preaching the salvation of God, even people are, you know, mocking him, 
Nobody is almost believing him, but only the disciples who were with him. You know? Just imagine the persecution, ridicule, troubles, and problems that the people around them do to them in Noah's generation as well. As they continue to finish the ark, mind you, they just don't do the ark as they want it to be. It was done in accordance with God's standard measurement, height, width, and length. You know? And faithfulness and righteousness in doing it. And Noah and his family completely followed every single instruction of God in preparing the salvation during that time, the gospel during that time, the gospel of the ark. You know? And let me just tell you this truth. Don't you know that the salvation of the ancient world, again, is that Noah's ark? It's the same as the gospel in this generation, the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment Noah started building the ark, he also started preaching the salvation because of the flood coming. And in those times, most people rejected him. And this generation, the gospel of salvation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, is being preached throughout the world. And yet, most people of the world is rejecting it. Because you see the, the resemblance. I hope that I, I'm making sense with you doing this resemblance. That truly, that God is accurate and true in his words. You know, in 2 Peter 3.10, this is what will happen in the second destruction. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which heavens will pass away with a great noise. This is the big bang of the Christians. We also have the big bang, and it will happen soon or sooner as we know it. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The second destruction is not by water or flood anymore but it's with the fervent fire and heat of brimstone. You know, in 2 Peter 3, 11, Therefore, he said, because of that will happen, therefore, the Bible says, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Of course. Therefore, as he says in 3.14, Beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to found him, by him in peace without spot and blameless. Basically, what he's saying is that if this is the thing that will happen, so you are expected to be this so that you will not be touched or hurt by that second destruction coming. You know? And conclusion to this is that you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand in 2 Peter 3, 17-18, Beware lest you also fall from your steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. It is saying that we have to stick. We have to continuously follow the instructions and leading by the Lord Jesus Christ through His Holy Spirit. Now, God is truly good and compassionate, brothers and sisters, giving us all the instruction, reminders, and warnings relating to these horrible things that awaits Satan and his demons and all his who will be found in his side, hell. By the way, I hope you know what, which side are you in. You might not be aware that you're doing Satan's will and not God's will, and will also in, will end up joining them in hell. Please make sure which side are you. There is a wonderful parable teaching in the Bible which helps us to look clearly where we stand regarding our Christianity. Whether we are truly growing in the faith in our Lord or staying in our old selfish way, making us unfruitful in the goodness of our God. Are we becoming stronger and stronger in our faith as we excitedly await for the Lord's return? Or are you really Achieving the perfection that one day God will complete in us? Or are you still living in your old self, stubborn, prideful character, thinking that you are okay? In Mark 4, 3-9, starts the parable of the sower. He says, Listen, behold, the sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed, and some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scourged, and because it had no root, it withered away. 
And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But others fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprung up, increased, and produced some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred. And he said to them, He who hears to hear, let them hear. You know, let's dissect the parable's components. God is ultimately the sower, Father God in heaven. Birds is Satan and his followers, probably the demons. Seed is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is known as the Word of God, being planted to everyone's heart. And men are the grounds. We know that there are four of them. No, let me tell you this. Seed will surely grow and bear good fruit unless something is wrong with the ground. No, let me repeat it. The seed will surely grow. No doubt about it. But the bearing of the fruits will depend on which ground it is planted. You know, kinds of grounds are the kinds of people in the world. The wayside, the rocky, stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good ground. These are kinds of people in the world. And three of them are kinds of Christians. The rocky or stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good grounds. These are Christians. But the wayside are the unbelievers, the atheists, the agnostics, those people who doesn't have faith in the world. You know, I just would like you to all to understand the parable of the sowers gives more emphasis on the grounds which represents the people. Basically, these four kinds of grounds represent four kinds of people who hears the precious words of God. That's what the Bible promises. Everyone will hear the gospel. You know, before the Lord's coming, everyone will hear the gospel. So you will be belonging to these four kinds of grounds. Where are you then? Where the three of them become Christians. Believer, yet only one, matures and become a good and faithful child of God. Like what I've said, the bearing of good fruit from the good seed of God depends on the kind of ground it is grown. Meaning the seed will definitely grow, but the bearing of good fruit continuously will depend on the kind of ground it has been planted. So big, the big question is this, what kind of ground are you? Are you the, thorny, the, the stony or rocky? Are you the thorny or are you the good grounds? And as you know, the parable of the sower starts with being born again, where the precious gospel is preached and heard or read then one can either believe, accept, or reject. And believing and accepting the gospel carries the greatest responsibility and crucial responsibility of every believer of keeping them, meaning believing, trusting, and following completely and faithfully. Let's start with the wayside. Well, the wayside in Luke 8, 12, it said, Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. There's a truth that everyone must know and understand in this passage. The taking of the way of the words of the Lord just don't happen without the devil having power or opportunity to do so. Otherwise, he can just steal from any people who hears the word of God and no one will be saved. Because he is good in stealing. If he can steal just like that, then no one will have eternal life. But there are four grounds and only the wayside where he had stolen immediately is where it happened. And why is this so? The truth is that the person who hears or reads the words of God is the one that will give Satan the power and opportunity to come in and do his rubbing. And his opportunity and power to steal comes from the immediate rejection and contradiction of the recipient of the words of God, of the gospel. Satan, knowing our actions of rejection and expressions of contradiction to the Bible or to the gospel, gives him the power and opportunity to steal from that person his ultimate salvation. Are you with me? I hope that you understand what I'm saying. 
that if you reject immediately or if you express contradiction on the gospel being preached to you, then that is the time and the power that you give to Satan to rob your salvation there and then. You know, the Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He will steal first your salvation so that he can kill you and destroy your soul in hell. That's what it is. That's why all people in the world who doesn't have Christ, who doesn't believe, who doesn't accept the gospel of Christ, you will all be killed by Satan and destroyed your soul together with him in hell. That's the truth, brothers and sisters. In Job 2.6, this is where a scenario where Job was protected by God because of his righteousness. And because of that protection, the devil has no power on him in his life. He said, the Lord said, Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. See? The devil didn't say, can I kill him? No, no, no. The Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So God gave the protection to Job saying, Satan, spare his life. Don't kill him. If God didn't say that, then Satan has the power to kill Job because the whole world, as I've said, is under the power of Satan. Especially if you are not with God. Basically what I'm saying is that the protection of God is with those who is for him and in him. Because Totally and completely, God will protect you against Satan. Saying to Satan, do not touch my anointed one. You know, the wayside represents people who hears the word of God, the gospel, but immediately shows rejection or contradiction. Again, giving the Satan power to take away their opportunity to be saved, their salvation. Basically, they will never be saved unless they will first believe in the word of God, the gospel, because as we all know, faith starts with believing in the gospel. The stony or rocky ground found in Mark 4, 16, 17. These likewise are the ones sown in stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness and they have no root in themselves. So endure only for a time afterwards when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. These are the there are several reasons why Christians, believer, doesn't grow maturely or completely in the Lord's wisdom and knowledge. The main, one main reason is that they worry so much about their lives in this world. Believe me, if you're a true Christian, your life is in the hand of God. So why worry? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, isn't it? Especially when it comes to health, safety, and financial security. A lot of Christians... Together with the people of the world are so concerned about their wealth, their standing in this world. They tend to feel more on the troubles and pains and problems that people or this world may do and bring to them in these areas of life. Especially in this pandemic situation, brothers and sisters. So many Christians are losing their faith, weakening in their faith, because they thought that God is not there with them. And that's the problem. Because their faith is not holding up because they are letting go of one precious thing, holding and trusting that the Lord is faithful in His promises that He will never leave us nor forsake us. They don't have the true trust and faith in God's precious words that says, look at this, Psalms 56, 11, In God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid what man can do to me. Psalms 118.6 said, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? And in Hebrews 13.6 even says, So may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? If you are reading the Bible and you will find in 8.31, it says, If God is for us, who can be against us, brothers and sisters? As Christians, persecution and troubles are to be expected. If you are a Christian and nobody is persecuting or troubling you about your faith, then you should be alarmed. 
and question yourself whether you're a true, really practicing Christian. Because all true Christians will definitely be persecuted because of Jesus. Like our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ persecuted for being the Son of God. You know? Persecution and troubles that make a stony and rocky Christian fall away from the faith because they fear more the world the world than the Lord. Always remember this, that the divine fear of God is what gives wisdom to every true Christian believers. You'll find in Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 15, 33 said, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Fear is what that caused by threat coming from people especially from loved ones having different faith. And this threat arising from these persecutions regarding the words of God makes the stony Christian choose and decide to turn his back on God's precious words and rather focus on their fear on the threat of this world. There is a great persecution that is to come, mostly to those Christians having different faith in the family. And Satan will definitely come to try to break the family apart completely. And this is to be expected, especially to those families having different faith and chose to remain hard-hearted against God's truth. And as we Christians, we just continue to share the gospel in truth to them uncompromisingly, faithfully, and lovingly, letting the Holy and Precious Spirit of God righteously do the rest. And being born again, having the Holy Spirit of God leading and guiding us, we must completely trust and diligently and faithfully follow the Bible as our instruction of life while temporarily living in this world. As what the Bible says, a newborn, as newborn babes, we need spiritual milk to feed in as we grow in our faith. And, only, and the only source of this precious spiritual milk is none other than the Bible itself. In 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3, it says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, and when you become born again, it said, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted the Lord is gracious. Our faith as born again Christians is just don't end by hearing, reading, and believing in God's words. It is just the start of our Christian walk. But the most important part is the application of those precious words of God. We have to live by it, brothers and sisters, because most words of the Lord are instructions and commands that will enable us to overcome this wicked world, that will bring us to the promise of eternal life in heaven. Without it, or practicing it, then you will be just like an unbeliever who doesn't care about eternity in heaven. In James 1, 25-25 said, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul, the Bible. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For anyone... If is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful hearer but doer of the word is the one who will be blessed with what he does. Even in James 2, 14 and 17 said, Faith without work is dead. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Does also faith in itself without work is dead? You know, we are con commanded by the Lord in Joshua 1.8 to meditate on the word day and night. This book of the law shall depart from your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, but shall med meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all it is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Believe me, just imagine the promise of 
having the Word of God in you promises success and prosperity as well. No? In 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 16 said, This is how and what the Word of God does to a Christian believer. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want you all to understand, brothers and sisters, that without reading or hearing what the Bible says, which is to us true Christians, are the true and faithful words of God, you will be lost. Without the Bible, one is lost, brothers and sisters. You will never ever find your way to heaven without reading the Word of God, the Bible. It is the complete for me and the only source of instruction given to those born-again Christians who are seriously and sincerely desiring to enter the kingdom of God. And to those who are not genuinely serious about their eternity, then this is, will just be another ordinary book having ordinary stories to tell. I would like to liken the Bible as a treasure map, showing where the great treasure is. And without the map, you will never ever find the treasure. I also liken it to a passport having the right visa. And without it, you will be denied entry to any country. So if you don't have the gospel, the word of God in you, you will never, or you will be denied entry to the kingdom of God. So in a nutshell, without you knowing what the Bible says, then you will never ever know your way to the kingdom of God in heaven. Simple as that. You know? Let's go to the thorny ground. The thorny ground in Matthew 13, 22. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and cares of this world and the deceitfulness and richness choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. The thorny ground represents those Christians who are compromising and lukewarm, who cares more for the pleasures, comfort, and material richness this wicked world offers. They are more concerned about their physical wellness over their spiritual. That's why they are so quick to set aside and lay down their spirituality and their physical and material prosperity. These are the Christians who believe that doing more good, although doing bad continuously, is okay. Because more good offsets the few bad things, justifying that everyone do bad things anyway, which is not true, especially if you are a true born-again Christian. These are the Christians who think and believe that they can walk with God while holding hands with the devil. A big deception from the world's principle and belief. Christian who prepares to go to parties and celebrations on the Lord's Day. Christians who don't read and believe completely in the Bible, making it impossible for them to know the Lord more and more and to gain wisdom and knowledge from God. Christians who don't believe in tithes and offerings. Christians who are so easily entangled with this world, pleasures, temptations, comfort, affairs, which truly hinders their spiritual growth and maturity in the Lord. Don't forget, the Lord says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's what the Bible says. These are Christians who believe that you can harvest, or you can have, sorry, that you can have your best life on earth. Believe me. If you're a Christian and you, you, you think that the best life is found on earth, then you are very wrong. Because best life can only be found with life in, with God in heaven. Christians who think that they can balance things on this world with the things of God. Thus making God in the same degree and level and weight against anything else, especially money and wealth. Actually, there are Christians who even believe that money and wealth are more powerful than God. They are forgetting and probably don't know what the word says in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the others. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
or money. Let's go to the good ground, the last one. And I pray and hope that you are, especially our family, the TGF. And I believe so that we are the good grounds of God. The parable talks about the very important good fruit, which is only produced in the last ground in the parable, the good ground. The good ground pertains to no other than the good, faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they're true disciples of the Lord. Christians who believe in the gospel of Jesus. Christians who read, listen, and do what the Bible says and instructs. Christians who totally and completely trust the Bible as the true words of the living, almighty God. Christians who believe and trust in the faithfulness of God's words that it will all accomplish its purpose. So as we close, brothers and sisters, let me ask you directly. Are you a good ground of the seed of God? Then where is the good fruit? Or are you a Christian that is having two-sided life, lukewarm and compromising, half for the world and half for God? Or maybe of the world and less for God? Maybe more of the world and less for God? Or even the vice versa? Then I must say to you, repent, for God will reject you if you don't. In Revelations 3, 15 to 16, this is what the Lord says that He will do to those lukewarm and compromising Christians. I know your works, that you are neither nor cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Oh, wow. This is horrible to happen to those who are lukewarm Christians. Are you a Christian who fears the world more than the Lord? that makes you easily fall away and backslide from the faith, then you also must repent. Because if you don't, for even the demons believe and fear the Lord and they even tremble, you know? But still, they will all be in hell and you will surely join them if you don't repent and come back to God. James 2.19, look at this, it says, You believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. Let me close and encourage you and enlighten you with this word of the Lord in John 15, 2, 5, and 6. It says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. I am the vine, the Lord says, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruits. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and they throw them in the fire and they are burned. Basically, the Lord is saying that without him or without you knowing him, without the word of God in you, then we will all be going to hell. Simple. You know. Then let me again ask you, brothers and sisters, what ground, kind of ground are you? Are you a rocky and stony ground? Are you a thorny ground? Then you have to repent if you wanted to get the promises of God in heaven, eternity. But if you are a good ground, blessed are you. And I pray and hope that we all be in a good ground for the seed of God. Amen. God bless you all.